and John. Um, I've never met Eric before, but uh, it turns out we have a lot of things in common. And uh, it's really, I'm really excited to see his program tonight. Um, Eric spent his early life working with horses, and uh, he was a professional jockey for 10 years. Can you imagine? Uh, but he retired from that and uh, got his mechanical engineering degree at the University of Tulsa. And is one of your professors here tonight? One of my high school. High school, okay, yeah. good. Uh, and uh, he has had roles uh, with oil and gas companies uh, through his engineering degree uh, as an executive there. And uh, he has recently become the full-time cattle rancher and co-founder and CEO of REP Provisions. And uh, he's going to tell us more about that. But in a nutshell, uh, it's taking a, a consumer brand of uh, shipping fresh frozen meats, all of it is grown on regenerative uh, ranches. And that is something that Audubon has been interested in for a long time. Uh, I used to work in the Nature Conservancy. They too have programs like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to hear what he's going to have to say. Um, he is also the uh, Chief Operating Officer for Rebellion Energy Solutions. And they do uh, plugging of old oil and gas wells. And it's kind of a new twist on that. Uh, they actually are doing it to prevent the methane from those old wells escaping into the atmosphere and contributing to global climate change. And uh, so they are using the credits for closing off those emissions of methane uh, as a way of selling and paying for uh, that work to be done on ranches and private properties and so on. Uh, and he can use that opportunity as well as, as a way to talk about his uh, regenerative ranching as well. Um, he's been a, a leader in that uh, particular profession and he's done it through education uh, and education by example. And uh, his double P ranch in Mounds uh, is his that he operates and uh, it is kind of the inspiration for uh, others that he's trying to get interested in that. Um, and I'm sure he's going to point this out, but uh, the ranch and uh, uh, his operations are Audubon certified bird friendly ranching techniques. And uh, that is a way that we can work with the public uh, private landowners <coughs> and uh, convince them to do things soundly, environmentally, while at the same time producing a great product for the consumer. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric and let him tell us about uh, his endeavors. Thank you. Jay, appreciate you guys inviting me here to talk about what I'm doing at REP and some of my other endeavors. I wanted to take a quick second to call out Mr. Land. I was, certainly was not expecting to see my old high school astronomy teacher here, but I want to tell you guys a little bit of story about him. If there's one man um, here that's responsible for me living this life today, it's that guy. He inspired me to look up at the heavens when I was just a teenager and that caused me to dream huge dreams and understand my place in this massive universe and how much and how critical it is to protect it. Like that, that I, and I'll never forget the day he brought his eight inch reflector telescope and I looked up at the Andromeda galaxy and it blew me away. And so that, I, I, offer, I, I gotta tell you, Mr. Mr. Lang was a huge inspiration in my life. Was not expecting to see him there, but I'm glad he's here today. So, 
part of you know what my inspiration to start Rep Provisions, and, and I'm going to kind of talk about this through the, present, the, the whole presentation, but we get a lot of facts on wildlife numbers, and that almost everything you read daily is saying things are declining and not in good shape. In fact, I just saw a study by the WW, the World uh, Wildlife Federation, that in the last, in less than 50 years, we've lost almost 7% of our wildlife population. Now that sounds like a huge number, and it is, and you get these different reactions from folks. It may be, you know, if it, it, may, it may be a line in political ideology or whatever, but um, you get different reactions when you tell folks that. But what I can tell you, what I've seen on my land corroborates that. It really tells the story, and one of my favorite birds ever was a bobwhite quail. Mm -hmm. And I grew up on a ranch in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and we had large numbers of bobwhite quail that roamed that property. In fact, I can remember as my dad, hunters would come to pay to work their dogs to, to hunt on that land and hunt bobwhite quail. But within 100 miles of that ranch a day, it's not, it's not there, it's homes now, there's nothing. It's wiped out completely. And so this number shouldn't shock us, it's pretty obvious. So that's, that's one way that we lose it. And also, in, in Monarch Butterfly, that's another one that I'm passionate about, and my, my beautiful wife back here is also passionate about that. She's got her Monarch Butterfly dress on, as a matter of fact. And these things really, really concern me. And we know that it's, it's human activity that's causing it. I mean, there's just, it's, it's hard to deny that fact. And we have to ask ourselves, do we want to live without these species? and how critical are they to our own survival. And I personally believe I do not want to live without them, and I think they're very critical. That biodiversity loss is, is something that we were not concerned enough about. And that was kind of the impetus for me to start Rep Provisions because I do know that cattle, the cattle industry along with the agriculture industry is a huge, uh, um, causes great devastation. There's just no denying that. But can we work with nature better? Can we make it where we can have all these species and provide food for ourselves? I'm hoping that through rep, I can kind of show this way and through, through other things that I know. For example, you know, um, one of the things I'm most passionate about is tall grass prairie, which Jay used to be a part of that tall grass prairie preserve in Osage County. And if we think about what's been wiped out of just the tall grass, what used to exist of 180 plus million acres of tall grass prairie from Canada to Mexico is in some estimates less than 1%. And Jay, I don't know where the numbers stand today, but I, I would say that's pretty, pretty close. Less than 1% left of this unimaginable biodiverse ecosystem wiped out in a couple generations or less. And this is what we did to it. We plowed it because it created the most rich soils in the world. And some of these top soils could be as much as three foot deep. But what happens when we plow? We release tons of carbon. We create erosion and wind erosion and water erosion. And it's, it's estimated that we're losing 75 billion tons of topsoil worldwide every year because of agriculture activities mostly. That's clearly that little thin layer of topsoil is what we all survive on. That's it. It provides every economy, every piece of nutrition that we get on that little thin layer of topsoil. And clearly losing that much every year means we're going out of business. So I, you know, I'm passionate that we need to change this. Um, now there, there's more than one way of just plowing to lose topsoil. As I mentioned, if we improperly graze our animals on land, that's another way. When you, and 70% and of our land's in a state of degradation that where we run animals on. So these things should be very concerning, topsoil loss. I mean, it affects a lot of things in our society and our economies and will continue to. So it's important that we figure out better methods to save that topsoil. Uh, Jay mentioned that we're kind of in this space right now known as regenerative agriculture. Um, I didn't give it that term, but it's what seems to have st stick lately, so I go with it. 
Um, and I would actually put um, agriculture in three forms. One would be extractive. This would be the current methods where we're plowing topsoil. We're using chemicals to for pesticides and herbicides and, and chemically derived nitrogen to fertilize it. These things I would say very extractive. So we're losing topsoil in those methods. We're, we're losing carbon that way. So we have to replace it with all these chemicals. I would label that as extractive. And then another form which you might have heard is sustainable. So better that that we're saying, you know, we're not taking more, but we're keeping things the same. That my only kind of comment on that is if it's already in a degraded state, you're keeping it the same, that's not good either. But then this new term known as regenerative is means that we're actually restoring degraded land, that we are building topsoil over time. And I would say that's kind of been nature's way all along. As I mentioned, that's why we had three foot of topsoil on the Great Plains. It was because it was continually building topsoil. Um, but just to note, you know, uh, uh, what, what, how I define it, I want to bring that into the system, but I want to talk a little bit about these four ecosystem processes that are so critical to how we define regenerative agriculture. And it's really um, comes down to the water cycle, which if we think about how water percolates through the earth and into the soil and into the atmosphere, that if it evaporates quickly or we can't absorb, it's going to wash off into our streams and rivers and create that erosion and create this unstable water cycle. So it's very important that we're able to absorb water in our land. And another comment on that is in the tall grass prairie, if you guys ever seen a particular plant species known as big blue stem, and I have it on my property, abundant um, big blue stem, and it's, you know, by June, it's six feet tall but that's just the start of it. We don't see what's below that surface, and those roots can go down you know, significantly deeper than that as well. And so when we think about those roots and what they provide for that water cycle, how they allow that water to infiltrate, I think that's a huge driver on keeping a good water cycle. Energy flow, that's just how much, how much energy are we flowing through these plants? How much photosynthetic activity is there? Community dynamics, biodiversity, we know biodiversity is critically important for carbon storage. And then the nutrient cycle. It's pretty well established that most of our foods today are less nutrient dense than they used to be. So if we can repair all these ecosystem processes, it's better for the planet health and it's better for our health. But um, what we focus on regenerative is outcomes. So when you think of organic, that's a practice-based system, but regenerative really focuses on the outcome. And the other piece on regenerative, it really takes livestock to make it regenerative. And why is that? Well, if we go back to the Great Plains again, what happened? We had millions of head of bison roaming those Great Plains that were leaving their dung and urine, composting those plants, and then creating that topsoil and all that biodiversity as well. So it really takes some form of livestock at some point in the process to really be regenerative. I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, so you, we get a lot of definitions of what regenerative means, and there's a lot of definitions out there, but this is mine, and I just came up that with myself, so you might read it uh, some other form, but it all gets back to the same place. But in me, it's about cycling nutrients in the place where they will do humans, plants, and animals the most good. And that means all animals, not just the animals not growing on there, but also the birds that live also the other little critters that live there. Um, any animal that lives on that grassland, we want to cycle those nutrients where it does all of them the most good. And really when you think about it, it's just restarting these cycles of nature's where, the, where they've been degraded and broken and, and maintaining them once they are repaired. So that's, that's my definition of what regenerative should mean. So how do we, how do we verify it's regenerative? You might wonder that. And I use a scientifically based um, program that was developed by the Savory Institute out of Boulder, Colorado. And it's known as Ecological Outcome Verification, or EOV. And basically we measure about 15 different ecological health indexes that are listed on the left. These are measured every year along with um, soil samples and water infiltration tests. 
And I wanted to show you, I was on this property just about a month ago. And the one on the left, what do you see? You see much of anything? And this is great, this is just cattle on this property. Um, what is your plant spacing, the, the canopy abundance? It's pretty low, right? Yeah. You see bare soil. This is just done by cattle within a matter of one growing season through the summer and into the fall. And this isn't a small property, it's pretty large. And it was devastated. And granted, we had a severe drought this summer, but I wanna show you, if you look to the picture on the right, what do you see? Dense plants, no bare soil, lots of biodiversity still. And this is in the fall, granted, so everything's dormant, but a huge difference. And I wanna tell you, you might think this one on the left is way far away from this one on the right, but it's literally 100 yards away. Just 100 yards. So that's just the difference in management they both run cattle, both the same, same numbers of, of, of cattle roam on each side of the property. One was managed different, and one was managed regeneratively. So this is the power in that. One creates bird habitat. One is storing carbon in the soil. One is repairing and holding, uh, um, um, absorbing significantly more amounts of water in it. Everything that hits that bare ground washes off or evaporates immediately. This is what I mean, once you break that water cycle, it's really hard to repair because evaporation happens so quickly. So this, this is the power of regenerative. So, but anyway, and just to go back to this ecological health index, it's measured through um, just a number-based measurement system. And you track that every year, and that's how we define if we're trending in a positive ecological health index. The one on the left scored a negative 40 e ecological health index. The one on the right scored a, a plus 60. So huge difference, two, two properties that are right next door to each other. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to dive into is the customer's way of thinking, because I have this kind of unique insight because I operate a brand and we're, we're, we're shipping direct to consumers nationwide. Um, none of this matters what I'm doing on the land if I can't sell it. That's just the simple fact. If the economics don't work, I will go broke. All of my farmer network will go broke. So it's very critical that our customer base understands what they're doing and they support us for it. But I am seeing a major change in how people are thinking. These things are becoming important to them. And yes, we have a, you know, a really big political debate Potentially, you might change your way of thinking, um, and you have you know the loudest crowd on the right and the loudest on the left telling you it's this way and this way. But there's a lot of folks in the middle that say, "Wait a minute, I'm going to think about this a little bit differently." Um, and what I said here is, if we live in a prison, the least we're not thinking for ourselves. And this is where I think consumers are trending. They are thinking for themselves, and they're taking in all this data. And, and the fact is, since we have. 2007 with the invention of the iPhone, they have a tremendous amount of data out there to look at, but they are absorbing it and they're beginning to see the differences in how they react to it. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on, on nutrition, this is, this is critical for us because we think we're creating a nutritional superior product, but what you'll see often is one group telling you red meat is bad for you and on the next, a guy telling you the carnivore diet is the greatest thing ever. Um, on one, telling you dare how bad uh, animal agriculture is, and then one is saying, hey, maybe red meat does have health benefits. Um, and then on this left, foods that make us sick, they have, they have beef. We've been told all along for years, <laughs> since the early 80s, since the USDA came out with their food pyramid, which is basically a high carb, low fat diet, that this is the way to go. However, we've watched our health continue to decline. And the fact is 40% of the population is, is obese or turning that way, and one in five already has diabetes. Um, we already talked about the less nutrients in our food, so I think there's a really compounding problem that the customer is beginning to say, hey, maybe all this stuff we've been told isn't exactly right. Maybe there's more to this story. 
And the fact is, red meat can be good for us, but it's our belief that red meat raised the right way is the best. And the data I can point to on that is when you measure, we measure our beef for the fat content, right? And so what we're looking for is the difference in omega-6 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s being more heart healthy, omega-6s being more inflammatory. And in grass-fed beef, or in a perfect human diet, let me say, it, that ratio should be one to one. And in conventional beef, we find that it's 10 to one. But in our grass-fed beef, we found it's that perfect ratio one to one. Why is that? It's because of that animal was fed its species appropriate diet of grass. And so that's one way in which we're telling people this story that hey, red meat can be beneficial for you, but it has a lot to do with how it's raised. That also holds true for chicken and for pastured pork that we raise, and then us all lamb and, and goat that we also raise as well. So I think all that holds true. When you give that animal its species appropriate diet, that product is healthier for the animal and it's healthier for us. Other thing on agriculture, um, we've talked a little bit about this, but again, diverse viewpoints. One saying we've got to we've got to tax cows and sheep because they have emissions, they have methane emissions, and one saying you know that that if you're going to do that and we're going to be vegan and we have to grow all these monocrops, well, we're also saying that's bad as well. Um, so where does it, where's it lie? Where does the middle lie? And the consumer is beginning to put these things together and say, hey, you know what? You know, animals used to roam this country in large numbers, and things were much healthier back then. So I think they're seeing that it's not that we need to shift everything to monocrops and become a vegan culture, but we need to figure out how we manage animals better on land. Um, because we've broken a lot of these natural cycles and movements of, say, bison, um, because we've cut this country up into little rectangles with the uh, barbed wire fence, but now we need to step in and be that natural movement cycle that mimics that natural process, that how bison used to roam the prairies. And so that's the whole point of regenerative agriculture, is to mimic those natural movements that used to occur for millions of years before we kind of messed it up. But the consumer is starting to see that. Other things, you know, climate change is a huge topic right now. Um, lots of really polarizing beliefs in that. But I think, again, in the middle, the consumer is getting all these different things. Climate change is a hoax. It's the greatest threat to human health. Um, and where does, where does the consumer think about this? And I think they're beginning to put it together that, hey, we know something's not right. We don't know all the causes, but we know something's not right and something needs to be done about it. And so we're offering that regenerative agriculture can actually be part of that solution. Because as I mentioned, what is life? It's carbon-based. And regenerative agriculture is creating much more life, above ground and below ground. And in fact, there's several published studies that show that animals grazing on land um, can, can sequester about three and a half tons of carbon per hectare every year when they're managed regeneratively. So one, yes, animals uh, grazing on land can be a net benefit for affecting um, carbon emissions. And that resonates with the consumer. Uh, this is one slide um, that I wanted to show on methane with, with cattle. And I wanted to kind of show what the differences are and why methane, that, that yes, beef do emit methane, because as they process that grass and they ferment it in their rumen and then belch back up, some of that from that bacteria is causing methane emissions for sure. But there's a difference. There's a difference between that methane in a beef cattle versus if you're just pumping it up from the ground and getting it. There's a difference because that cow is part of that methane cycle and it, it rotates from that grass through that cow to the air back again. So it's not that we're creating tremendous amounts more of methane, they're part of that natural cycle. And in fact, uh, cattle grazing on grasslands, a lot of this methane is eaten by 
methanotropes, which are this methane oxidizing bacteria. So they're all part of that cycle. So I do believe there's a difference between methane emissions from a beef cow <coughs> and methane that's just pumped up from underground that's, that's stored for the last 60 million years. Uh, and one thing we're trying to do to help eliminate a lot of those methane emissions, that, as, as um, mentioned earlier, that I work for a company called Rebellion Energy Solutions, and we're targeting all these emitting methane wells. This is a map of ones we've targeted already to date, and there's 3.2 million so far, but I'm telling you that's a really low number. Uh, we've been surveying wells in just Washington County for the last month, and we're, we're finding that number's probably going to be double or triple that. Um, so significant emissions just happening from abandoned oil and gas wells. So no operator, these were drilled probably in the 50s and, and, and on, and the, the operators are not solvent anymore. So we're targeting those. The great thing about this is I get direct communication with those landowners of those oil and gas sites. And many of them are farmers and ranchers. And, um, and, and that creates a great conversation I can have that, hey, how can we restore more bird habitat? What if we convert your farm and ranch to regenerative and potentially one day you can collect carbon credits that you're storing on your land. So it's, it's creating these really great conversations where I feel like I can have a lot of impact of restoring this state and beyond through that and through creating that supply chain through rent provision so that they have an outlet for the product. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I have a lot of concerns about where we're at today in the world and the path that we're leaving for our children. It scares me to death. I have a 13-year-old son, so I definitely want to make sure I leave it better than I found it. And it's great that we've got folks that are committed to helping that make that happen. So, thank you guys. Aren't there studies also that uh, cattle that are grass-fed emit less methane than those that are, say, corn-fed? Well, not exact. there are, but it's actually the opposite. <laughs> what people are saying that animals grass-fed emit more methane because they take longer to get to a, a, a reasonable weight to process. So when you feed an animal corn, a straight corn diet, he puts on fat. It's kind of like me, and, and they put them in really cramped environments. They feed them straight corn, high-carb diet. It's kind of like... You know, if I lock you in that closet and fed you nothing but donuts, you'd gain weight pretty quickly. And so it's the same what we're doing with cattle, but because of they, they gain weight faster, the claim is they don't have, they don't emit as much methane because they have a shorter life, right? So that's the claim. What I would argue against is when you put a beef cattle in these cramped conditions, there's no grass. No grass is just a dirt feedlot, right? feed them a diet of straight corn, yes, they will gain faster, but the methane they are emitting is all of it's going to the atmosphere. None of it is getting absorbed in that grassland in that natural um, methane cycle that I talked about at the end. So, you know, in my mind, this is way worse for the environment than just cattle grazing on grassland. That uh, leads me to <clears throat> wonder, uh, the, I appreciate what you're doing, and interested in becoming a customer, the, the, the market share that uh, a farmer or a rancher like yourself has versus what you just described with feedlots and that, what what kind of percentage market share would a regenerative type? Uh, it's, it's less than 1% right now. That's tiny. Yeah. Um, the only thing I can say is that it, it's really accelerating over the last couple years and it appears that it's getting quicker over time. There's a lot of big, bigger organizations that want to offset their carbon emissions and they see this as an outlet to do that. A lot of big food companies um, are beginning to say, hey, we want all of our products to be regenerative verified. So it's beginning to reach a point where I think it can scale faster, but it's very small right now. This is, this is true. Yeah. 
And, and that's through some of the carbon credits that you found? It, it potentially could lead to that, that's my hope, but, but uh, companies, big companies, um, like General Mills or, or Applegate, they're seeing this as a way to offset their own carbon emissions through regenerative agriculture. So they want to publicize this with their, with their customers and their stockholders. So they're seeing this as a way to garner more support for their products. So I think it will we'll reach a tipping point one day, but it's you know it's not there today for sure. But we've got it. We've got to support you know brands like this. We've got to you know we got to get that word out. We got to educate consumers. So, but they are listening. They're they're right for it right now. I mean, this would have never been at any point in history that I think we could be having these conversations like we are. But I do see some tipping points that could happen in the next you know five to ten years. Okay. When you uh, sit down to talk with a rancher and have the conversation. <coughs> Uh, about the regenerative agriculture, uh, what kinds of responses do you get back from them? Is it they don't want to bother, or they don't care, or they're all in for it, or what kind of responses do you it, get? Yeah, it, it varies. Um, a lot of the times, it's like they're you know I've been doing this this way for my whole life. I'm not going to change now. I hear that a lot. Um, some people are super interested when you tell them, hey, perhaps this could improve your bottom line because nobody in the cattle industry is really making a killing at it. It's really hard to survive in a conventional market. Um, and you know, you know, when I say conventional, most cattlemen today here in Oklahoma, once a, a, a beef gets to an age that it can be marketed, they take it to a, a livestock yard somewhere in the state, and then it's auctioned off for you know, the bottom dollar. Sometimes prices are good, sometimes they're really low. Most of the time they're pretty low. Um, and so they're at the mercy of that livestock market where we're saying through rep, hey, we can offer you a better price that's more stable anytime. And that, that when you start talking money with farmers, that gets their attention that, hey, I can improve my economics. I'm starving here. I'm dying. Like, I need help. And they do. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a known fact. I think farmers are one of the highest suicide rates there is it's because it's such a hard job and it's hard to make money at it. So we can offer that that support there if they'll just you know change their methods. So I think I think that's where we have a real opportunity. The real tipping point that could happen there is if I said, hey, not only will I pay you more for your product, but we will be monitoring your land for carbon storage, and you can potentially collect carbon credits on that. That would be the real kicker for us. So if a rancher says, okay, I'm interested, uh, what do I have to do? Yeah, so then, you know, I, I begin, I have a group in, in Colorado that does all my ecological monitoring for us, and so we would get their rangeland scientists out there monitoring. They would do baseline measurements on that property, so that, that it's basically a two-day process. Depending on the size of the property, it could take a couple days to get everything cataloged. So they're measuring all their species of grasses, all the wildlife populations, you know, all the, the organic matter in the soil, things of that nature, and then they'll track that every year after that. And is then we keep the same, that in a big database. Is that the same as those 15 indexes? It, it's the same thing, a little, it's a little more in depth. That first baseline measurement okay. is more complex and more data to do that. And so that, that baseline is done every five years, and the EIGI index is done every year. And but, then, but what does the farmer then have to do? Nothing. Yeah. I mean, well, now he has to, he has to, what we will do is offer him grazing plans, grazing management plans that he can follow. He's not forced to do it. But we do know if he doesn't follow it, his trend line will not be positive. It'll be negative, and then he eventually would be in program again. So it would behoove them to follow at least some form of a grazing plan that we can recommend. A lot of times they inherently know they need to be doing these things, but you know maybe whatever gets in the way, they don't do it. But if there's an inspiration to do that because it's an economic one, then I think they will. And does that include things like rotating pastures it's, or having fewer yeah, animals per acre? Right, right. All those things, you know, uh, stock density at certain times, depending on what's going on ecologically on this this spot, you may want a lot of animals or you may want none for a long time. So it, it all depends. Reading your land, reading what the grasses are doing, reading what biodiversity looks like. All those things, they start to train their eye to that. And I'm telling you, once you see that, once you understand it, you can't unsee it. It's like, and so everywhere I go across the state, I'm like, my gosh, this is devastation, and it is. But 
the good news is because Oklahoma gets 44 inches of rainfall a year, that if you just change your method slightly, it can, nature can repair very quickly. That's not the fact on the New Out West where it's very brittle. It takes a long time to change. But, but Oklahoma is in a unique position because literally if we just make some minor changes, we can have dramatic impact within a year or two. So then if the ranger buys into the plan that you're proposing, you sell their Blueprint? Yeah, so exactly. So right now we've got about 15,000 acres enrolled in our holistic management. Um, we've got um, grass fed beef, pastured pork, pastured chicken, and then pastured lamb. And what we do is we will we line up, we have all the processing dates with our USDA processor. They'll get them out of pasture that morning, take them to the processor, and then have them processed that same day. The interesting thing about this is if you look at a conventional Processing. Let me walk you through that. You know, the farmer takes it to a livestock yard where it's auctioned off to the lowest bidder. They send these large meat packers, all that hours, maybe 12, 15 hours away to a feedlot where that beef will sit for 90 days straight, eating nothing but a, a grain diet. And then it will be loaded up to a processor some many hours away. So it goes through all these torturous, like programs before it actually gets processed. Like, I mean, it's brutal on that animal. And that's why they have to give them lots of antibiotics and other things that need to keep healthy. For me, we get them out of pasture and they're hanging on the hook within, sometimes within an hour. And that's you the, have customers who are buying these? Yes, yeah, nationally. So, I mean, my point in saying that is it's just a much kinder, gentler way to process animals, if you will. Like if that's, you know, if that's your, your problem with eating meat, what I can tell you is we do it in the kindest, gentle way possible that respects that animal. So I'm, I'm just a little confused about how this whole process is working as far as when somebody's like the face thing, how when somebody's finally gone. So are you just giving them information and then like like how how are they changing their their pastures of where this like Right. Fertilizer and some of those other things on top of the grazing. What other things do you have to do? Or yeah, well, in? I mean, obviously it's not just giving them a grazing plan. Well, it mostly it, it is. I mean, so there's you're looking not looking at the number of cattle they have, and then you're saying right. Okay, so this basically, is what land you have. yeah, with our our rangeland biologists that measure the land that measure the grasses, they'll report back to that farmer what's going on in the particular paddock. So they'll look at the diversity? Yeah, they'll look at the diversity. They might, they might and, 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 you know, and typically it gives that farmer a guide because sometimes they're managing a lot of land. Sometimes they're really small and they can really keep a close eye on it. But a lot of times these guys have you know, thousands of acres. It's hard to know what each, how each paddock is performing or how each section of their land is performing. So that, that feedback on these measurements is critical then to make management decisions for the next you know time they have cattle coming through. And maybe, like I said, you know, maybe this paddock needs plenty of rest. Maybe it needs a controlled burn, perhaps. Those management decisions are for the farmer to make. We can't make them for him. But what we're saying is that next year when we measure, if he has made wrong decisions, it's going to show up in the data. So it's a guide for them to make management decisions as they manage the farm, how they need to manage it. But we're offering the data to say, hey, you know, maybe I need to all look in here for this piece of the property. And so do you make money from, like, do you get a percentage of no. what they sell? We, well, so we have, we can put contracts in place with them to purchase their animals, so that creates that supply chain for requisition. And what we're saying is we can create a more stable income for them because they have more of a guaranteed price of what they're going to get for their animals. Ms. Yeah, you mentioned the quail and such on your land when you were growing up. Do you see any change or do you even reintroduce certain species? Yeah, um, I, I'm in a little island where I live. Um, most of the land around is pretty degraded, so it's hard to um, create the right uh, 
enough habitat for quail because they need a pretty big expanse, but we still have some. Remarkable. I don't know how. Because <laughs> I'm just like my own little spot there, like you saw my neighbor is just dirt. Um, but there's still, I still see, but we see lots of diversity of, of birds. Um, I'm also a big proponent of bluebirds. So we put um, over the last year over you know, 50 different bluebird houses on all of our little tipos. They create great habitat for bluebirds and they also give me the added benefit of controlling the fly population on our bee cap. So it's a great win-win for, for both of us. But yeah, on, on, on my property in general, we, have, we still have a lot of diversity. Um, so it's exciting to see, but I worry about it because it won't matter if I'm just a little island. You know, we need, we need a bigger spread. Yeah. Kind of an unformed question about hay. So there's, there, you know, you drive around town to town, in especially northern Oklahoma, maybe eastern, mm -hmm. there are fields that are cut for hay. Yeah. So how does hay figure into your... Uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. And what I will tell you is it is a, it is a bit of a necessary piece, but haying um, especially late in the year, leaves that ground pretty much bare. So it leaves that. It's, it's probably, round bells are probably the most destructive thing an agriculture would ever invent. Mm -hmm. Because now farmers and ranchers are able to just all year cut, 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 cut that grass down because they can sell these round bells. And yeah, that's, it really has devastating consequences. So I approach it. Um, differently, I prefer to stockpile as much grass throughout the summer growing season and save that for winter grazing. Now, it's, it's sometimes it's impossible to stockpile enough, um, so I will hay a small portion just for that reserve to have it in case I need it. Um, but the good news is because of me doing it this way and because of improved grazing practices, I have more grass typically than my my neighbors so I can graze longer. So most years I don't set any hay out till December where other guys are doing it in October. So I have that added benefit from you know, the genetic method that just creates more growth. But I, but I, what I am here to say I hate mowing. It's the most, um, to me it's the most devastating thing you can do on land and certainly for habitat. And we are way overdoing that. We're really in this it's weird too because people, I, I like to call it this kind of um, <coughs> golf course um, logic in our head that we think that's beautiful. Like when you see a mowed field, you think, oh, how beautiful. And if you see grass growing this high and weeds, they're like, oh, that's terrible. Why didn't that farmer mow that? And so we're really in this mindset that everything has to be mowed. And it's like, it's just at this point, it's like guys are mowing just recreationally just because they think it looks pretty, and it's literally the most devastating thing we can do. Um, so yeah, I, trying to get that word out about, you know, don't use so much hay, don't cut all your fields every year, it's very damaging, and it leaves nothing for, for habitat for species through the winter, which is, which is kind of what we got. Uh, how about a Netflix special today? Yeah. Or <laughs> I, you know, that would be great. Do you know somebody? <laughs> we could use it, yeah, yeah. We got a great story to tell. I hope that as this goes along, that we'll we'll begin to get kind of more national recognition. I think it's super inspiring to people, and it gives them great hope. So my that would be yeah, that would be a great opportunity to showcase that for sure. Yeah. How many pieces of birds can you report on Thomas, do you? It was. <coughs> 60 something, I don't remember exactly. We had their biologists and I want to say it was, I can't remember exactly, I think it was in the 60, 65 something, but it was amazing. Um, and they just came for two, 22 days when they measured, but I, I, and I read all the species and I recognized them, but there was more on that list than they even captured those couple days. So I don't know what the true number is, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's really cool to see. That's one of my favorite things kind of watch birds and see the different species. And also, other point, um, we have a lot, a lot of red-tailed hawks, mm -hmm. like just everywhere. And they're hunting constantly, constantly hunting, finding mice, 
on our land. Do you think they're finding any mice on that land across from them? None of it. So that's my point of the same with mowing, how destructive it is, creates no habitat for, say, field mice, which is, you know, food for red tailed hawks. So, but they're beautiful to watch. We get to watch them out our front door every day. It's really impressive watching them. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out uh, where does the money come up? You're going to have to pay the biologists to come and do the surveys and, and so on. So where does the money come from to pay for that service? And then um, let's say there's a rancher and you say, you need to let this, leave this part alone for a year, yep. let's say. So is that rancher going to have to raise fewer cattle because they don't have as much? I mean, it seems like there's also a front end investment to get all their land yes. to a, a level that it's sustainable. It, it can, it can be. And just the comment one on who pays for the, the monitoring. Well, we're lucky because Audubon has enough funding that they actually pay for that. They've never made us a dime for the Audubon. This um, is the National Auto Audubon? Yes, yeah, so we're, that's, that's why they're so great, such a great partner. Now, I also work, you know, mm -hmm. our main regenerative methods, of which they approve of, is um, through the Save Institute. That comes out of my own pocket. So rep for business. So we have to make that up in, in the cost of our product somehow. But I, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful that one day us doing this, that carbon credits could pay for that. That would be an ideal scenario. Um, and let's see, back to your comment about the ranchers on if they're, um, I kind of forgot where we were going with that. But Well, if you're going to have to set aside some land. Yeah, to, okay, to right, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Grade as much. yeah, exactly. And so what you've got to understand is like regenerative agriculture is not, um, it's not, it's, it's not some destination re you reach, it's just, it's a journey. So little improvements can make a big difference, as I mentioned earlier. And so it doesn't mean that that ranch must be perfect from day one. That's not what we're expecting. But like if he has like a thousand acre ranch and he runs, you know, 200 head of cattle, and they just roam free wherever they want, whenever they want. There's literally no management to it. If he just puts, you know, say one fence down the middle and manages two pads, that's better than what he was doing. But could we do more? And we try to encourage them to do that through their ecological monitoring. So it's we can't let perfection be the enemy of good in this. You've got to start somewhere. But as they start seeing better results, um, they'll get better at it. And and the truth is. <coughs> Regenerative farming and ranching is really an art form. Like you can, as you learn about it, you get better at it. But it's truly an art form, and it's not. It's not. You know, it takes time to develop. But we've got to get guys started down that path at least, and kind of educating them on what can make a difference. Um, and then when they see positive outcomes, then it gets them super excited. When I look at your outcomes here, <coughs> yeah. Well, those pictures I showed you was after you know, some severe drought. It was the worst I've seen since 2011. Um, it was bad. I mean, we had, I think May 15th was our last rainfall, and I don't think we saw a drop, I want to say till October, on our property. So in the hottest, I mean, it was 100 degrees every day. Like, it was brutal, but, you know, it, we still had plenty of grass. So it kind of proves to me that this, this has some, you know, this works, right? I mean, if you can survive a really sustained drought and not reduce herd numbers too, too badly, you're doing, you're doing pretty good. You're doing something right. So are you moving, are, are, you, are you creating small paddocks and moving those cattle every day? So I have 13 large paddocks, and then within those 13, depending on the scenario, what's going on, I'll, I'll cut it into smaller paddocks with temporary electric fence. So, um, and we do that with our hogs and with our goats and sheep and with cattle. Um, but, you know, the, so depending on what the process is, we could cut it in smaller, sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. Sometimes it's like, man, you just can't get to it, you can't get to it, but you know, you're always paying attention to that. But that's what we try to do. We try, I mean, I would prefer to do daily movements, but you know, time doesn't always allow for that. But I think the bigger point here is that I'm actively paying attention to the grass I'm growing out for me, and that makes a huge difference. 
I was going to ask you, that, does it take a couple years before people start to see a profit in their, their new yeah. ways, but in the meantime, like, they're going to maintain their profit level and their land's going to improve, and then they'll have the best of both worlds, making a little bit more money and having better land? Correct, yeah. Okay. They, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, like I mentioned in Oklahoma, because we have pretty good rainfall, usually, it's more consistent than it is out west, right? Um, that they can repair land pretty quickly if they just offer the right conditions. And so they can see, literally you can see changes in one year, you know, when you just make some minor improvements. And you gotta understand, some of this is subtle, you know, it's not all, but I think that the biggest value probably is encourage, encouraging them to have more biodiverse pastures. So more pollinator habitat, more, you know, species that would benefit um, grassland birds. So once they start thinking down that path regeneratively, things start to change. And we, we really encourage biodiversity. Like, I'm not afraid of a weed. Like, I do not, like we have, we have one weed, it's called ironweed, and it's all over my property. It, it creates a beautiful flower in the summertime. And it is, I see monarchs on it all the time. And I get criticized by my neighbors, like, why aren't you spraying those weeds? You're, you're not you're not creating grass for your cattle mm -hmm. and I said you know what it, my, my goats eat it so I'm growing goats so what's, yeah. I could turn that into a resource but in the meantime it creates great pollinator habitat and that's just really that mindset of thinking yeah. you know in that regenerative mindset Dude, I call what's, it. what's created that it, it, is this all the golf course mentality or are I, you I don't know it's crazy yeah I think it is this golf course mentality that they want to see a smooth clean yeah. uh, and another 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 point to this is when I hear people driving down through the Midwest in Iowa, and all these you know tens of thousands of acres of cornfields, row after row, and the people comment how beautiful that is. And that is ecological devastation. And the same thing is just ecological devastation is a lot of farmers and ranchers have converted their pasture land to Bermuda grass because it's higher protein. So yes, it will cause cattle to gain weight a little faster, but it, like, it's a monocrop. It's ecological devastation. Like nothing can exist on that except cattle. And that's what we're trying to say. That's not the best for soil health. It's not the best for that nutrient cycle I talked about. And it's probably at the end of the day, not the best for your cattle operation. So how do you market your meat? You say you take it from the farm, you have it processed quickly, where you have certain companies that buy your meat because it's superior, or is it yeah. is that done? No, I mean, um, our, our sole marketing is just through social media, that's it. Like, we try to engage with customers personally through Instagram and Facebook, um, and that's and, and we just try to gain followers by to show them what we're doing and say, hey, you know, <laughs> it's, we're in this social media world, but that's kind of how we reach customers now. And then we have a great um, advertising campaign on social media, so through Google Ads. And so are these Instagram. restaurants or individuals or some of them? Just individuals. So everything right now, I, I don't do anything through retail. Retail is is really hard, man. They they try they it's hard to make a profit in retail and the way we're doing it. So we, we reach out direct to consumers. So we're able to ship within any place in the country within two days. So you can order and depending on where you're at, the next day you might have your meat sitting in front of your doorstep. Are these customers having to buy like a quarter of a beef? Or no, are we, they we, have, we have everything organized like to fit suit pretty much any household. <coughs> like, um, we have all these, you know, um, uh, pre-made boxes with different cuts in them, and then we have, gosh, I don't know, 60, I don't know how many speeds we got now. It might be close to 100. But you can go through it and see, ah, this is what I've been wanting. I'm going to order this box and try it. Um, and it's, you know, there's something for anyone. We try not to sell individual cuts. We do occasionally, but it's super difficult to move a whole beef when you have just those middle cuts, which everybody wants, you know, your fillets and New York strips. So we try to combine those with other things that um, help move that whole thing quicker. Because that's the only way we can kind of sort of stay ahead of the game and make a profit. In an ideal world for a regenerative 
practices were the standard, could you meet the demands of the U.S. consumer, or yeah. would the U.S. Co consumer have to change their diet practices to make this work? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and I get asked that a lot. Um, the, the big knock that people will tell me is, Eric, yeah, it's great and all what you're doing, but you, you, you know, it, it, you can't feed the world that way. Um, and I would just, you know, a lot of times my comment is that, you know, conventional agriculture, you know, yeah, we've got to answer that question as regenerative farmers and ranchers, that's true. We've got to answer that question, but what I, I always comment back is, you know, conventional agriculture has some major problems too that's just not sustainable, right? So at some point, you know, if we stay on current methods as extractive as they are, we will run out of topsoil and food for us. So, you know, you're right to, to call that out and we need to answer that question, but I truly believe that through these, these better methods of, of for, for example, for grazing, creates more grass, which then in theory can have the farmer create more feed. So, there's, there's a lot of big questions to be answered on that. I don't, I wouldn't say that we have the answers today, but I truly believe that it is a sustainable way to feed the species that are, and maybe the only way to feed the species. Just to follow up with that, that, it makes me wonder the, the history, how we came to where we are with beef being what's for dinner. Uh, it, it started back from what I understand, kind of in the Civil War era, when they are needing to feed soldiers far away and, and be able to transport quantity of protein. And before that, when, what, what's a brief history of the cattle industry? Um, yeah, so you're right. I mean, it's how we kind of early on in the, in, the, in the days when we used to um, drive cattle from Texas and graze all that grass and then up to Kansas City to be processed or put on trains to be processed. Um, I think, in, and uh, pretty much all that beef was grass fed, you know, back then. It's when we, you know, fossil fuels were utilized and we created all this huge machinery. And then we realized, you know, the, the Haber Bosch process to create nitrogen fertilizer came about so we could grow plants really quickly. And then things started shifting and getting really disrupted and we got in this more monocrop corn um, and then soy and then some other other monocrops that, that created feed for cow that we saw would make them fat and they gain quicker. And that really has been going on and accelerated since the 50s. Um, and feedlots, you know, I think there's, gosh, there's about 90 something million head of cattle in, in the 30 so million feedlots every day. Uh, so it, it provides us the most amount of beef for sure, but it disrupts so many natural cycles that I, I honestly don't see. You know, number one, as a consumer, I would not want to eat that, but is this truly a sustainable way to, to grow animals, and is it the right way? I think consumers are saying it's not, but yeah, there's a big history there. Um, how do we end up in this? And, and it's a lot of it was technology that had these advancements in how we grow crops, but then at the end of the day, if you got to have all these inputs, is it is it really going to be worth it? You know, that's my question. So I don't know anything about carbon credits, but yeah. I assume they work just like any other tax credit, dollar for dollar, off your taxes, right? No, that's yeah. yeah it's this totally different market. So when I'm talking about carbon credits that are verified carbon credits, they go on an open carbon exchange, and then they're marketed. And right now there's a lot of companies like Google, Microsoft, that are very interested in offsetting their Apple. They want to offset their carbon emissions as an industry because this resonates with their stockholders. And they want to be able to say they're carbon neutral or carbon negative, and that they're kind of being part of the solution to climate change, not an exacerbator of it. So they basically, when you have an accredited carbon, and for the oil and gas stuff that I'm working on to offset, we use American Carbon Registry. And so they have a methodology for measuring that methane and creating a carbon credit for it. And so that will go in an open carbon credit exchange and, and a lot of these companies looking to offset their emissions will, will purchase that. And that's what will drive the value of it. So it's, not, it's not mandatory, 
it's just companies trying to you know trying to do the right thing. So that word measure is key, right? It has to be measurable yeah. to get that credit. So how do you see if you could just you know, like you said, ideally those credits would help propel this line of business. How do you see that measuring happening? So in soil, it can be measured precisely um, just through organic matter content because that has a percentage of carbon. So we can measure it pretty, it's, it's, I'm making it sound easier than it is, it's actually, but there's methods, you know, ideally you'd want to get a point every few feet, and that's not economically feasible. So there are verified, accepted methods now that some of these carbon registries will verify that yes you are storing this much carbon in your soil but it has to have a data point I can't remember I think it's every 20 acres or something of that nature a soil sample basically that measures the carbon in that soil and then they track that each year and that volume that is additional is what they would call that credit and there's some published studies that show on um, grasslands that three and a half tons per hectare is, is possible um, sometimes more. I've seen studies where you convert cropland, monocropland, corn to grassland, and you get 17 tons per hectare, so a significant portion that we've just restored that to. So people are kind of catching on to that. It's really, but that carbon market needs to develop a little more. It is growing, but it needs a little more time to develop to get the right price. Any more questions? <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, this is really good for the um, homeowner because um, I live in Midtown on Crow Creek, and I have a relatively small lot, but it is nothing but um, pollinators and annuals. And um, when I first started, my the street was here, and so was my dirt, and now I can stand back, it's about this tall, because all year long, I get crops of grass, and I've been spreading straw now. So I have about yeah. eight bales of straw that I'm spreading, and so the nice thing is, you don't have to till your yard. People think how hard gardening is, it's not. Right. You, you make soil, you build it up, you don't dig. Um, I had a handyman that was helping me, and he um, was digging up a spot for some tomatoes, and I said, don't break the soil. Yeah. That's, we have to sequester that. Do not break the soil. You're, we're going up, we will make our own soil. So if you're a gardener and you think it's too hard to work for your back, just steal <laughs> your neighbor's grass and their leaves and find the houses that you like that don't have dogs that mulch their leaves in big plastic bags that makes my heart break. But you drive around. I used to keep trash cans in the back of my car with rakes because there's some pine trees over by Home Depot. And I could get probably 16 trash cans of pine needles in an afternoon. I just go back and forth and haul them and drag them and spread them on my yard. Yeah. So for the gardener, how much better is that? Yeah, I, you know, there's, I think it's over 40 million acres Imagine if everybody had your project, what we could restore for. And the whole middle section line you know, is summer flocks. Yeah, but yeah. like I said, these people, they think it's so attractive to have their grass this small. Like, it's an ecological disaster that if we had more. I live by a big park, and once you turn yeah. the corner and you come up, you see this, for about three months, you see this splash of purple. Yeah. And it's and, it and just have the context. They, you can still have some of your yard, but let's create some habitat out of that, too. It's, it's, once you get it started, it's easy. It's it is. not hard it's easier. work. It's easier. It's easier than mowing. Yes, <laughs> I know. It's easier and cheaper than mowing for sure.